Okay, and uh, we're recording. So uh, let's see. So uh, real quick before I get into the math, um, before we get into the math, I spent this weekend grading. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I am mostly done, not quite but mostly done with the exam grading. Um, I expect confidently that I'll be able to get it done on tomorrow. I can't today. I'm teaching all day today. But uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, tomorrow uh, afternoon probably be my guess. Okay, so uh, back into the math. Uh, we were talking last time about Green's Theorem, and you'll see Green's Theorem makes an appearance right there. Um, and by way of a little bit of sort of uh, clever trickery... We're basically able to rewrite Green's theorem into what we call the two-dimensional divergence theorem uh, that I have circled in blue here. And uh, a neat fact, uh, but we uh, you'll notice in this approach, we, we basically, uh, the Green's theorem is doing the heavy lifting here. Green's theorem was what we actually originally proved from a point of view of accumulation. Right, and again, keep in mind this is a really fundamental idea to all that we're doing in chapter six and seven is that there are quantities of interest that we find are accumulating quantities. And in Green's theorem, the point was that circulation is an accumulating quantity. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Even though we got <laughs> the uh, two dimensional divergence theorem from Green's theorem, it is, in fact, its own accumulation theorem. You don't need Green's theorem to be able to derive it. So uh, boundary flux also accumulates. And the picture of why boundary flux accumulates is right there. Right? And we talked through the details last time, so I won't go through that again. Uh, but uh, uh, roughly speaking, the point here, of course, is that when you cut something in half, when you cut an area in half, that edge... Uh, that appears uh, twice when you're adding up the individual fluxes uh, is oriented that way outward as part of D1, but it's oriented that way as outward as part of the boundary of D2. And so what we have is that this edge appears twice but with opposite orientations and therefore they cancel. So it's structurally identical to the argument for why circulation um, is an accumulating quantity. It's just kind of a, you know, different details, of course, because there's different geometry, because it's a different quantity. But structurally, it's uh, kind of the same. And that's an eyebrow raiser, very interesting. Okay, so just uh, for the purpose of summarizing uh, what we've got, um, uh, here's our old calculation. This is our, what you might call our initial two-dimensional accumulation. Right? We make the argument that mass accumulates. Mass has this feature that the whole is the sum of the parts. Of course it is. It's mass. That's how mass works. Right? And then we connect to the idea of, um, of density in that there is this relationship between the accumulating quantity, the mass, and the corresponding sizes over which it's, a, uh, it's distributed, namely areas. Right? So mass density. So notice, morally kind of the same thing happens when you talk about Green's theorem. It's just that now the accumulating quantity is circulation and the integrand is now circulation density. But it's structurally the same kind of idea. And then likewise, we have the same kind of a thing with the 2D divergence theorem. Namely, the accumulating quantity is boundary flux. We don't tend to think of that as a stuff or a substance distributed over area, but it behaves exactly like it is. And so it's really useful to think of it that way. And then likewise, the corresponding notion of density. Since our accumulating quantity is flux, uh, our density is flux density. Uh, side note, this term here, this is just a cultural point, but I think it's good to know. This term is extremely common. I did not make this up. Is very, very common. Uh, it's just another way of uh, interpreting divergence, of course. And, of course, divergence is also a very common term. But for whatever it's worth, when I was an undergraduate second major in physics, uh, I heard this term flux density more often than I heard the term divergence. It's just that common because it's just that natural. It really makes sense. It's a great way to think about divergence. Okay. All right. So, moving along. Uh, 
Um, I want to point out another accumulation theorem that we've seen. We're kind of up to, uh, depending on how you count, you could say the mass one is uh, sufficiently old. It's not really a new result. But certainly we've got two accumulation theorems here. Um, uh, Green's theorem and the divergence theorem are both accumulation theorems. But they're not our first. Uh, we previously saw another accumulation theorem. We didn't think of it in those terms at the time. In fact, we weren't even in this class uh, when we saw it. Uh, it's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Y'all saw this long ago, long ago, right? And it's not, again, not usually expressed in these terms, but it's really useful to do so now. There is an accumulating quantity involved in the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the accumulating quantity is called, well, I'm calling it change. Uh, if you want, you can think of this as instead, uh, I like the term, uh, output change. And I'm going to put that in here just for kind of temporary purposes, output change. Um, so we don't think of that as being a substance or a stuff, but I'm claiming that it behaves like a substance, like a stuff, in the sense that it accumulates uh, over uh, over intervals. So um, uh, easy to argue, by the way, that change accumulates. Let me give you just kind of a verbal argument. Um, let's think of my height as a function of time when I was growing up. Right. So when I was five years old, I was, I don't know, about this tall. Right. When I was 10 years old, I was, I don't know, about that tall. Right. So there's a certain amount that my height changed between ages five and 10. So let's keep that in mind. So there, this was the initial change from age five to age 10. Then from age 10 to age 15, I grew another certain amount of height. So now let's ask, yeah, but between the initial age of five and my sort of ending age of 15 in this conversation anyway, um, how much did my height change? Well, it's the sum of the, I mean, from five to 10, and then from 10 to 15, grand total, I my height increased. The change in my height was, well, the sum of those. Of course it was, right? That's, I mean... It's, uh, the hardest part about that point is realizing why it's not obvious. Right? Very, very natural. So output change is an accumulating quantity. Um, <clears throat> and now here's where it gets a little bit weird. Uh, I'm going to point out that uh, you know uh, the uh, change in, in uh, the output value of the function is the derivative times the change in the input value of the function. This is an old interpretation of derivatives. But notice I've written this differently here. I've written now, I've written this integrand, I've written the derivative as being a density. And that's a weird point of view on derivatives. I'm fairly sure you've never seen that before, or very few of you have seen this idea before. How do we normally think about derivatives? Well, slope of a tangent line. Um, Velocity, if you're talking about position as a function of time. Uh, I like the idea of thinking of it as a sensitivity. I heard an economist describe it this way one time, that if you have some parameter uh, in, a, in an economic system, when you make a little change to that parameter, like interest rates or something like that, well, that'll change something else in the system. And the output change versus the input change. Sensitivity is a very natural way to think about that. So various different ways you can think about the derivative. I'm proposing now we think about the derivative as being a density. And here's why that's not that weird. Let's look at a graph here. And uh, there's a, a little piece of the graph and I can talk about um, you know, the rise over the run. And let's think about how to interpret the rise. Well, the rise is output change. Literally, it's my accumulating quantity. It's the quantity that is accumulating of interest in this theorem that we're dealing with. So quantity, and then per unit what, right? What's my denominator? Well, my denominator is, well, it's the run, and you can think of that run as being, uh, you know, dx or delta x or something like that. But notice it's also a size. This is a size of a piece of the domain. So I have, as with every other density we've ever seen, 
accumulating quantity per unit size. That's a density. All right, so again, I grant you that this is a weird way to think about derivatives, but I do think it's extremely useful, and I want to encourage you all to think in these terms uh, that uh, uh, derivative can be thought of as a density. In particular, then, notice the fundamental theorem of calculus that I'm, I've written in a weird way here, admittedly, but uh, this fundamental theorem of calculus you can view as an accumulating quantity as an integral of a corresponding notion of density. Okay, so why do we care? Um, new point of view on something we're already very familiar with. Um, here's kind of a picture of, um, <clears throat> of a uh, changing value of some function. Uh, so the function in question, let's say cruises along like that and then it goes up, oh man, let me try that again. Cruises along like that and then it kind of jumps up and cruises along like that. Right, there's uh, some sort of a function. Uh, what's the change in the value of this function over the given interval from A to B? Well, you can see the change right there. It's the value of the function at the point B minus the value of the function at the point A. And so we tend to think of change, well, it's computed anyway on the boundary. Right? And things that are computed on the boundary, we tend to think of on the boundary because that's where we computed them. I suppose that's natural. But now let's just kind of think about it directly, though. If I were to pose to y'all directly, looking at this situation, and ask the question, where did the change happen? Right? Where did this function experience the change. I don't think any of y'all would hesitate to say that this is where the change happened, right? You can see the function increasing in this green region here. And look at the graph. The function's not changing over here. It's not changing over here. It's changing for these values of x in here. So what we have here is another example of a, an accumulating quantity that is measured on the boundary. But that's not where it actually happened, right? It's measured on the boundary, sure, but it actually happens in the interior. So the first observation I want to make, you know, why is this a useful uh, point of view about things is um, this is so, this is a concept that's so hard to digest when you're thinking about Green's theorem, right? When you're thinking about Circulation happens in the interior, but wait, but I compute it as I'm moving along the boundary. It seems like it's intrinsically on the boundary because that's where you compute it. And yet we, we're not stuck on that here, right? We, we have a better picture. I can see more of what graphs are awesome. I can see everything about what the function is doing. And it's perfectly obvious that even though, of course, I measure this accumulating quantity on the boundary, it's perfectly obvious it happens in the interior. So what I want to advise you all to do is to chew on the idea that as clear as it is here that the accumulating quantity is happening in the interior, right? It's really very much the same point to say that circulation also happening in the interior. And then further detail. Not only does it happen in the interior, but the density tells me how much, right? Now I'm going to zoom out so I can fit more of this onto the page. Um, the density, aka the derivative in this case, literally tells me how fast the function is changing, or you might say, how, you know, per unit size in the domain, how much change is happening at any given point in the domain. Where the derivative is larger, aka where the density is larger, there's more of it happening in points like that. And where it's smaller, where the derivative is smaller, aka where the change density is smaller, well then there's less uh, happening at those points. So that's kind of a beautiful thing. It, this is don't, the, the derivative here is not just a magic function that you put in here that makes the integral work. It's more than that. Its values are telling you specific information about where your accumulating quantity is actually, at where and how much 
your accumulating quantity is happening in the interior. Now, just as a sort of a uh, uh, silly example, and this is this is really. Uh, uh, forgive me for dragging you down to trivialities of single variable calculus for a second, but just for the purpose of extending an analogy. Um, uh, you can look at this function here. It changes by a total amount of 9 between x equals 0 and x equals 3, or you might say on that interval, the total change is 9. So where's that change happening more? Uh, I can ask, for example, let's look at, uh, you know, at the point 2, there's a certain amount of ha change happening in the vicinity of the point two, uh, and then there's a certain amount of change happening in the vicinity of the point one. How would I decide if there's more change happening in the vicinity of one, or is there more change happening in the vicinity of two? Hey, well, you, for one thing, you can just look at the picture. Right? It's perfectly clear there's a lot more change happening here. But algebraically, what's the algebraic tool that, that literally computationally tells you this? It's the derivative. The derivative that you can compute at both of these points, one and two. And, well, wherever that's the biggest, that's where the most of the accumulating quantity is. Right, that's where the most of the changes happen. More change is happening in the vicinity of two than it, than in the vicinity of one. You don't have to think of it geometrically, although of course in this case we have the luxury that yes we can. Uh, in this case though, um, and more generally this is more useful, we can see algebraically. I don't have to have a geometric sense for it. The algebra, the density, F prime being the change density, where it is larger, that's where more of that stuff, in this case change, is happening. Okay, all right, now with that in mind, again, the purpose of this flashback to single variable calculus is to set up an analogy so that we can try to do the same kind of reasoning for Green's theorem and for the 2D divergence theorem. So here we go, let's talk about circulation. Circulation happens on the boundary, you might say. Certainly, we tend to think of it that way because that's where we see it, right? Circulation is computed as a vector line integral on this oriented curve, for example, as I've got drawn here. So that's where you measure circulation. Sure, absolutely. I claim it's actually happening in the interior. I claim that we can furthermore kind of even see exactly where it's happening and to, sort of to what degree. Um, and let's think about uh, you know the way we visualize circulation. Uh, remember I have this point of view that I like to think of a leaf that's been dropped into the water. Imagine the vector field representing the flow of water, maybe a little river or something. And let's ask the question, what happens to this leaf? Sitting right there, well obviously it flows downstream to the right. But furthermore, it's being pushed the same amount on the left and on the right. So I would imagine that it just floats kind of straight downstream and it doesn't particularly spin or twist or anything. It just kind of goes. Okay. So I don't see any circulation happening here. And if you were to compute Green's operator, Green's operator here would be zero. In that region. Okay. <clears throat> now let's look at another leaf that's been dropped into this uh, into this fluid. Let's say maybe you know what? Let me give myself. You know what? I'll do it down here. That's fine. Okay. There's another leaf. Here's the thing about that leaf. It's being pushed downstream. Sure, of course it is. But notice it's being pushed less on that side and more on that side. Right, you can see the vector field lines, the vector field the arrows are getting stronger the further you come down. So sure, the leaf is floating to the right, but I propose this leaf, as it flows downstream, would be twisting as it goes. Because it's being spun that way, effectively, by the water. Right. So this also is indicated by the value of Green's operator. And if you were to write down a formula for this vector field and compute Green's operator, what you would find is that it's positive in that gray area. So it being positive, 
is the algebraic indication that this is where the circulation is actually happening. Again, we you know we detect this purple boundary circulation there on the boundary. You you measure it on the boundary, just like well, I mean you measure change for a function like this. You measure it on A and B at the endpoints, aka on the boundary. That's where you measure it, but that's not where it happened, right? It happens in the interior, and the derivative tells you how much where. Likewise, circulation, yeah, you measure it on the boundary, yeah, sure, but that's not where it happens. It happens in the interior, and the density, aka Green's operator, circulation density, tells you how much where in the same way. All right, ditto boundary flux. All right? Oh, this isn't quite going to here. Let me zoom out so I can fit this all on. Um, boundary flux. I can talk about uh, boundary flux on this rectangle. Again, I have a vector field drawn. And uh, let me just get these arrows highlighted. There's how I would measure um, uh, outward oriented boundary flux on this rectangle, the solid rectangle. Measure it, of course, on the boundary. And again, in the same way that I claim that it change doesn't actually happen on the boundary, you just compute it on the boundary, right? Likewise, boundary flux. Yeah, it's computed on the boundary. That's not where it's actually happening. It's happening in the interior. It's happening in that gray region. And you can uh, detect this in a couple different ways. Again, if you were to write down a formula for this vector field and compute the divergence, what you would find is that the divergence is positive here in this gray region that I have highlighted in green. It's positive there. It's zero over here and zero over there. It's positive in this green region. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, you can kind of see that. Uh, let's uh, zoom in a little bit, draw some pictures. Let's imagine I were to look at a region like this, this little orange region here. Um, let's talk boundary flux. Um, how much fluid is flowing? You know, what's the net flow of fluid uh, out of this region? Mm, well, I mean, here's the thing. Yeah, there's, uh, there's fluid flowing out, sure. But the, whoopsie, fluid's flowing out, but the fluid's flowing in at the same rate. There's just as much fluid flowing in as there is flowing out. Net, there's zero flux on that little region. And ditto everywhere else in this whole sort of white background region over here. There's no flux happening there. You can just directly see it. And if you were to compute the value of divergence, what you would find here in this region, you would find that the divergence is zero for the vector field there. No flux happening. Whereas, if you were to look at a region like that right there, let's think about the uh, boundary flux. Well, there's a certain amount of outward flux. There is also some inward flux, but notice these field arrows are kind of increasing as you go to the right. So there's more out than there is making up for it going in. And so the net flux here, the total boundary flux on this little orange region would be positive. And that would be evidenced by divergence in this region being positive. So algebraically, divergence points to where in your interior that flux is happening. Just like derivative does, points to where change is happening. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll show you now an algebraic version of this. So this is how the algebra will flesh out. Um, this uh, is a circulation and flux analog of this example that we did here. Here we're, we were looking at the accumulating quantity of change, and the derivative was our density, a.k.a. our tip-off of where the change is happening. Here we're going to be looking at circulation and flux and their corresponding densities, Green's operator and divergence, are going to point directly to how much and where those things are happening.
So specifically, uh, we've got a vector field given, and we're going to look at the following couple of points. I'm going to look at 3, 3, and 2, 4. Um, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of circulation uh, overall, and there's a certain amount of that that's happening in the vicinity of each of these points. Um, which one of these points has more circulation happening? Right? At which one of these points is uh, there greater fluid circulation than the other one? And that question is answered by looking at circulation density, a.k.a. Green's operator. And you just evaluate circulation density, a.k.a. Green's operator, and you see where it's the biggest. And, well, it's the biggest at that point, and so, therefore, it is at the point 2, 4 that there's more circulation happening than at 3, 3. Everybody on board? I mean, all I'm doing, this is just highly analogous to what I did here. And I did a simple calculation of change density and see where that's the biggest. And that points to where there's more change happening. Okay. So same thing here. Highly analogous uh, for, um, for uh, flux between these two points. Where is the more flux happening? Well, we will look at flux density a.k.a. divergence. We will evaluate divergence at both of these points. We'll see at which point is the divergence the greatest. And, well, it's just looking at the numbers, it's this one right here. And so here it is this point, 3, 3. There's more flux happening, if you will, at 3, 3 than there is at 2, 4. Okay. All right, enough of that. Okay, so we're going to move on now to 6.3 and talk about conservative vector fields. This is uh, there's a lot of beautiful ideas in here, and uh, we're going to find, uh, by the way, that the as we, the further we go on in chapters six and seven, the more connections and analogies and relationships and just. Uh, uh, this kind of thing is going to happen. So we're going to actually find in 6.3, as we discuss line integrals, and the fundamental theorem of line integrals, you can see, is going to be one of our first things we're going to discuss. And we're going to find that there are shocking relationships between the line integral theorem and Green's theorem. And furthermore, that these patterns will continue. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, 6.3. Let me start by talking about the word conservative. You'll see here conservative is defined as any vector field that is a gradient. Which brings up the question to me, why are we using the word conservative to describe a vector field that is a gradient? Uh, after all, we already have a word to describe a vector field that is a gradient. The word is gradient. I've never really understood why we need this word. Uh, it comes, the motivation for this word, conservative, comes from a uh, certain fact of physics and how potential energy works. And you all have heard about conservation of energy, in the, not in the ecological sense, but in the uh, kinetic plus potential, always the same, you know, et cetera. Um, so uh, the, related to that, there's a, there's a motivation. But anyway, we, we don't need that word here because we already have that word. The word is gradient. So anyway, you're going to hear the word conservative elsewhere. Uh, when you hear the word conservative vector field, just remember, oh, what they meant to say was a gradient vector field. All uh, right. So here's the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Um, awfully familiar looking. Not exactly, of course, right? But doesn't that look just like the fundamental theorem of calculus at a glance? I mean, you see f of b minus f of a and everything, right? Furthermore, the integrand over here, the integrand that in the fundamental theorem of calculus would be the derivative, here it's the gradient, which is a kind of a derivative. It's really analogous, very closely analogous to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Everybody with me? Everybody see that analogy? Okay. All right, I want to give you some sense for why this is true. Um, and we'll do some, we'll do an application of it and move on. Um, and uh, y'all probably seen proofs of the fundamental theorem of calculus previously. Uh, I uh, am going to take a proof here, a uh, point of view here that is, uh, again, uh, moving kind of in the, in the direction of this point of view I'm trying to promote, namely 
the ideas of accumulation and the idea of density. So uh, here we go, the accumulating quantity, just like with the fundamental theorem of calculus. The accumulating quantity is change. Again, you can see on the right-hand side of the equation, this is what we're computing. We've com we're computing here the total amount that the function is changing as I move along a curve this time, as opposed to as I move along an interval on the x-axis or the t-axis or, or what have you. So still, though, change. And I claim that it is accumulating quantity for the exact same reasons. Let me do it like this. Exact same reasons, because if you look at how much some function, and by the way, my favorite metaphor for this is uh, altitude. Thinking about the function of altitude uh, defined on um, on uh, the you know uh, the, the map. Uh, thinking of altitude as a function of location. Um, so from that point of view, how much your altitude changes as you move on that part of the road? How much your altitude changes as you move along? this part of the road, I hope it comes as no surprise that if on the blue part of the curve your altitude changes by 1,000 feet, and then if on the orange part of the road your altitude changes by another 1,000 feet, grand total over the entire curve, doesn't it stand to reason that your altitude changed by, well, the sum, namely 2,000 feet? Well, of course it does. Right? That's just... I, I, again, the hardest thing about this statement is is realizing why it's not obvious. Right? It's very intuitively natural. Okay. So, change is an accumulating quantity. Uh, once you have that change is an accumulating quantity, we can now ask, okay, well, on each little piece, though, if I were to look at a little line segment here, uh, starting there, ending there, imagining this as some little bitty piece of the curve, and if I ask, well, how much change happens on that little piece of curve, what is the change in the output value of the function given a certain change in the input to the function? And the verbal alarm bells go off in your mind, relationship between input changes and output changes. Chapter two, derivatives, right? That's what derivatives do. In particular, in this case, it's dot product with the gradient that gives you the relationship between input changes and output changes. Right. And then I can rewrite, by the way, I'm going to rewrite dx as tds as we've done several times in the past. Uh, and this gives us a, uh, a relationship, a direct relationship between uh, input change and output change. And let's see, I'm going to circle this in blue. Uh, the relationship between uh, the output change and the size of the input change. Right? Keep in mind, we're thinking of change as a accumulating quantity per unit size. So accumulating quantity per unit size. And you can see it right here. It's gradient dot t. That's the thing you multiply by ds to get the quantity delta. Accumulating quantity per unit size. So that's change density. Uh, okay, now we can uh, put that into the theorem right here. Here it is, change density. And uh, let's see here, we've already made the observation Oh, see, I'm running out of colors. We made the observation that change is an accumulating quantity. So the total change is the sum of the little changes as you drive along the road. Old news. Uh, we just got through uh, indicating that change is change density times size. That's up here in, in blue. And we've got ourselves a theorem. Here it is. This is our... Uh, fundamental theorem of line integrals, one point of view anyway on fundamental theorem of line integrals. Um, this integral is computes total change. Now, different point of view, a little bit of a variation. Let's look instead at this equation. In the past, we've always thought of a density as 
quantity per unit size. Where I think of size as well, the size is a scalar because well, it's a it's a it's intrinsically a scalar, right? How big is something? How much area? How much volume? How much length? These are all intrinsically scalar quantities. What I want to do now is take the uh, flexible interpretation of dx. dx tells you size in a way, right? dx is a vector whose magnitude is the size of that little piece of curve. But it also tells you more. It also tells you which direction. It tells you the orientation of that little piece of curve, what the direction that that little piece of curve is pointing. So I'm going to view dx as being an oriented size. And so let's think now about change, not per unit size. Let's think about change per unit, if you will, per unit oriented size. And in the same way that I would have declared, uh, and I already have declared that as the density, I'm going to likewise declare gradient itself to be oriented density. This is just kind of a point of view. I'm not going to be rigorous about this, but I think this is a helpful point of view. Um, uh, the gradient is telling you two things. It's telling you um, how much change per unit size, but it's also telling you, yeah, with the understanding that that's if you're moving in this other direction, if you're moving, if you're moving specifically in the dx <laughs> in the unit tangent vector t direction. So um, there's more I'm going to say about this later. For the moment, um, I just want to point out that if you take an oriented view of size, you get an oriented view of density, and gradient is that what I then call oriented change density. So it's the density, it's the uh, sort of uh, the resulting integrand in the fundamental theorem of line integrals interpreted in this way. So take your pick. Um, they're uh, equally valid, but it, this is a really useful idea, this idea of an oriented density. We are going to talk about this more later. It's going to be more important later. Uh, for here, this I just want to think of this as kind of a, a first introduction to let y'all be some kind of chewing on this idea, weird idea of an oriented density. Okay, let's do one. Here we go. Uh, question says to compute a line integral, everything you need is given. Uh, before I get into this solution here, um, let me uh, make a couple of strategic observations. So when you find an example like this, it usually will not come in a context. Right? Now this example is coming in a context. This example is coming right after we talk about the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And so given that context, it's almost obvious that, well, we're probably going to use the fundamental theorem of line integrals to compute this, right? Otherwise, this would be a bad first example immediately following our discussion of the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So that will not usually happen, right? Most of the time on an exam, if there's a question that says, hey, here's some particulars, compute this vector line integral, there's no context. There's no sort of implicit hint of what method you're supposed to use to compute it. And notice here, not only is there nothing in the statement of the question saying use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, there's kind of a vague suggestion by the curve coming to you parametrized. It's almost like it's kind of nudging you in the direction of, hey, pull back through the parameterization. Use the plug and chug formula, you know, f dot x prime dt. Kind of looks like, I mean, it's, I mean, you could totally, you don't even have to parameterize. It's already parameterized. There's a strong temptation to go that way. And you could do it. It would be a pain. Well, it wouldn't be that bad. It would be har much harder than what I'm about to show you. So the reason I mention this is I want to emphasize this is something y'all have to constantly be heads up about, right? Part of questions like this is figuring out how to decide which of the several methods that you could use to solve this problem should you use to solve the problem, right? What's the best way to do it? So anyway, how exactly to go about deciding on that is something we will eventually get to. There is, uh, we need to develop more tools first uh, before we can uh, give good answers to that question. For the moment, I just want to point it out and again, uh, be on the lookout as we go forward for how to do this, how to diagnose. Here we go, solution. 
notice that our vector field is a gradient. Easily confirmed, right? You can take this function, x squared, y squared, you can just straight up compute its gradient. A couple of partial derivatives, easy to do. Boom, you get that it's this function, this vector, the given vector field f. Hey, our vector field is a gradient. And when you have a vector field that is a gradient, you can compute line integrals with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And that's what we're going to do here. Our vector field is a gradient, and we're going to compute the line integral with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Now, in order to use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, here's our formula, f of b minus f of a. Apparently, I'm going to have to know these points a and b. Namely, I'm going to have to know the starting point of our curve, the ending point of our curve. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of plugging in here. And let's see here. Apparently, we start where t is equal to 0, which puts me at the point 1, comma 0. Right, and my curve ends where t is equal to pi. That puts me at negative one comma zero. So there you go. A is one comma zero. B negative one comma zero. Compute, compute. Plug into the. We've got our. We've got our function uh, little f uh, right up here. Let's see. Let me highlight uh, little f. It's right there, x squared, y squared, and compute, compute, and the answer is zero. So I didn't have to do any trick there to speak of, right? If I had if I had done this the old-fashioned way, if I had taken my parameterization and plugged in, you can see there'd be trig everywhere, right? X and Y over here are cosine and sine. There'd be a bunch of trig. X prime would have sines and cosines. That would factor into the dx. There'd be sines and cosines everywhere, and you'd be doing half angle formulas and uh, u substitutions. And not that you can't do it, right? You could, but it'd be a significant effort. This approach here crushes it much more easily. Everybody happy with that? Okay. All right. Now, I want to confess. Um, I did sweep a very significant point under the rug here. While it is easy to confirm that that gradient is the given vector field as claimed, what's not immediately clear is where did I get this function from in the first place, right? What made me think that that should be uh, what I like to call the anti-gradient, right? I like the term anti-gradient because it's it's what you take a gradient of to get what you were given, right? It's undoing the gradient. So in the same way, the anti-derivative, right? Totally analogous, anti-gradient. Where did I get that anti-gradient? And that's going to have to wait until uh, Wednesday. Uh, we're not going to get to that today. But the good news is a method, nice little technique. It's not that bad. And uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about that Wednesday. Okay. All right. Any, let me pause for questions. How are we doing? Yeah. What scenario will you not be able to do this, and you have to do it the way we learned earlier? Right. Right. There are sadly not only some but lots of vector fields that simply are not the gradient of anything. Okay. And uh, if that happens. If they're just, and I'm going to show you exactly how to identify when that happens. We'll get again. It won't happen today, but it'll happen soon. Uh, in cases where your vector field is just not a gradient, then uh, notice the fundamental theorem of line integrals does not apply. Fundamental theorem of line integrals requires that our vector field be a gradient. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, though that's that's when you can't do this. Yeah, is that cool? Everybody else, all right? Yeah. Couldn't I theoretically have a constant in that term? Yep. The gradient would be the same thing, but that would give me a different answer. Nope. It wouldn't? Nope. Nice, nice thought. Uh, but uh, it's just like with the fundamental theorem of calculus, the plus C, like if you were to put into here a, uh, you know, 
plus C there and a sort of a plus C there, those C's cancel. Yeah, yeah. This is good thought. Good to be concerned about. Yeah. No, but you can pick any anti gradient that you want and it's all fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so next idea. <clears throat> Path independence. Uh, this is a weird concept. It's, uh, I like to present path independence as being kind of implausible because at a glance it really feels like it should be implausible. Uh, and this is uh, half for intuition purposes and half for dramatic purposes. We'll get to the drama in just a minute. But um, I'm going to start with a really obvious observation that if you're computing a line integral, let's see, let me get into the highlighter mode again. If you are computing a line integral such as this, well, the curve matters. I mean, of course it does. It's part of the it's part of what you're computing. You have to compute the vector field at the points on the curve. That's where you're computing the line integral. Of course, the curve matters. I mean, I, again, I it's, I think this is just uh, extremely clear. I mean, how could we possibly expect the curve not to matter? <laughs> um, and yet, you'd be surprised. We're gonna, we are gonna um, uh, see some specific examples. There are some vector fields, remarkable, amazing vector fields, where the curve basically doesn't matter. Only the endpoints matter. It's so weird. There are some vector fields where only the endpoints matter. This is what we call path independent vector fields. So if you have a vector field, such as uh, this F right here, if you if this if this vector field has the feature that whenever you have two curves with the same starting and ending points and you for any two curves with the same starting and ending points you always get the same value for the line integral this is what we call a path independent vector field and again it seems it seems implausible you're telling me that for a vector field to have this feature, then no matter which curves I look at that share the same starting and ending point, those do matter, that's not going away. But uh, any curve, there's a bazillion curves that all have the same starting and ending points. They all have to give me the same value for the line integral? Seems unrealistic. Now, just to emphasize how unrealistic this seems, Here's an obvious example, and look how little trouble I had to go to to find an example of such a vector field. This is going to fail to have the path independence property. And again, I'm going to say, well, of course it fails. My God, how could anything succeed to have this property? So here's how easy it is to show that this fails. If I were to move along this blue path here, well, along there, the vector field zero, there's no line integral there, Along here, I'm moving exactly perpendicular to the vector field. The dot product is zero there. And so on this blue path, the well, line integral is clearly zero. I mean, I don't even need details. It's clearly zero. But now let's look along this green path. Uh, whoops. Along this green path, well, on that first piece, I'm moving perpendicular to the field. Again, the dot product zero, no line integral there. But as I move along this second piece, I'm moving in the same direction as the vector field. The vector field has a significant magnitude. That dot product is positive, And well, unavoidably, this green line integral is positive. So these values, different. And again, of course they're different. How couldn't they be different? <laughs> I just want to emphasize that the purpose of this example is to point out we should never in a million years expect for path independence to ever happen. It just seems too implausible. The curve obviously matters. Okay, now, with the drama set, um, here's the counterexample. Here's where path independence happens. It happens for gradient vector fields. Every gradient vector field. I have formality. I got to talk about regularity requirements. I need it to be continuous. Um, every gradient vector field in that category. <clears throat> 
is path independent. Shockingly. And not only is it path independent, it's actually pretty easy to show that it's path independent. Because if I look at this first curve, C1, and if I look at this second curve, C2, right? Well, these curves C1 and C2, they start at the same point A, they end at the same point B. Each, in each case, uh, looking at both of these line integrals, each one is a line integral of a gradient. Each one, then, I can evaluate with the fundamental theorem of line integrals by looking only at f of b minus f of a. You know, these two curves, though, have the same a and the same b, and so I get the same f of b minus f of a calculation. It's literally the same point, right? So these two integrals, they're both computed by the same expression from the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So of course you get the same answer. Of course these integrals are always equal. And so that means that these two, excuse me, that this vector field F, this gradient vector field is path independent. And that works every time for path independent, you know, continuous, but uh, continuous uh, gradient vector fields, they're all path independent. Shocking fact. And we're out of time. We will pick up here on Wednesday, and uh, y'all have a good rest of your Monday. See you Wednesday. Oh, and as usual, don't forget to uh, m get me to mark you as present if I haven't already done so. Where's my? Here it is.